<laughs> Hi and welcome everyone. I'm Christine Fisher, your host of this edition of Cape Inn Art Waves, where every week we have the opportunity to be introduced to talented artists and makers. Today I'm so pleased to welcome the dynamic and very accomplished painter, Linda Holt, who has deep Cape Ann ties, having lived here for many years, and now resides in Boston. You might be familiar with Linda's rhythmic koi paintings, along with her richly textured abstracts, landscapes, and portraits. Her work is fresh, rich with color, and in over 40 collections, public collections, I might add. Her private collections include Graham Gunn, president of BU, dean from MIT, curator of The Fog, and the conservator for all the major Boston art museums. Pretty heady collectors. Linda has been represented by Beth Yerdang of the Beth Yerdang Gallery in Boston. She's received many awards and distinctions and has a tremendous bio of solo, group, and public exhibitions. Additionally, Linda has served as an arts leader, educator and arts critic. I give you Linda. Welcome, Linda. Thank you, Christine. I'm happy to be here and thank you for including me in this wonderful program that you and Jackie have taken on. Oh, you bet. It's great to see you. Uh, and I feel delighted that you can be with us. You know, I want to start because you, I think, have been very fortunate that you identified at such a young age that you had a talent and had a leaning uh, as a as an artist, as a creative. So talk to us about your journey. Well, I, I think it started um, as, a, as a young girl. Um, my um, uncle was an artist, so maybe that's a part of it too. But I, in Girl Scouts, I, I got the art badge. Uh -huh. That was a very big deal. Yeah, of course. A little, a small victory. Um, to accomplish that, and we did all kinds of things. We it was mainly pottery, but um, I still uh -huh. have some of those pieces uh, somewhere here. <laughs> um, that's it's really how it started, and then it continued in high school. Um, although I was painfully shy and totally unaware that people even noticed what I was doing, <laughs> but I was elected by my high school class as the most talented, which surprised me and was delighted to to have that accolade too so that was the origin of the. That, that's quite a lot of recognition honestly <laughs> especially in high school so then you went on tell us about your journey you went on to Skidmore I did go on to Skidmore and that's where I really emerged out of my shell my 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 introvert shell um, and gain confidence. And I think going to a women's college, which it was at the time, was very helpful for me. Uh -huh. so, um, yeah, that, that was really, and I had, I had wonderful instructors, even in high school, I had a great art instructor. And I think the instructors had a great deal uh, to do with my interest. My yes, life. influenced you, right, yes. influenced you. And then your journey becomes very interesting because you took a bit of a, a detour now, talk to us about that because it's played out beautifully in terms of your career and your choices. And I didn't know that at the time, but I, I went into business for 10 years. I worked at Lord & Taylor in New York and then uh, they transferred me to Boston and I was in Boston uh, for a year doing that. And then I left and became a headhunter for six years. Mm -hmm. So, and that was really wonderful experience. I had to be so organized because I made 50 cold calls a day and, I, and these people would call me back and I had to remember why I called them and who they were and um, so I really learned organizational skills and projecting myself and being able to handle rejection and all three all three of those skills became vital I think to any artist yes right well I, I call you the true hybrid I mean you really <laughs> You are such a hybrid talent, which has really served you well, I think. So let's fast forward. I mean, this has been such an unusual period of time here with, with our forced pause. How are you using this time, Linda? Well, um, I've been using it as a, as a renewal time. Uh, I love and, uh, that. Yeah, because uh, it's, there's so much negativity in, in, in our lives right now. It's hard to not get drawn into that. Yep. So, and I think artists tend to go within anyway. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I have been really focusing on organizing. I'm digitizing my slides, which is a mammoth undertaking. I think I have 
oh, over 600 slides, and I'm almost done with that, and that's huge. Wow. And that wow. was really wonderful because I got to see my progression over all these years, which is yeah. really interesting. I forgot a lot of the paintings I even did, and I yeah. couldn't even tell you where they are. But, um, but that's been really fun. And I've also been exercising, which is great. And I think now people are buying art still. Uh -huh. um, because they're realizing that they want to surround themselves with beauty um, mm -hmm. while they're stuck at home. I love hearing that. I mean, that's very reaffirming. You know, I love the comments when you and I spoke earlier. I loved your comment with respect to digitizing your work around feeling like by doing this, you also felt like you had some control over your, your time. And it was a way of healing given the noise, right, that's kind of in the atmosphere during this period of time. Definitely. It hasn't really changed that much for me because for many years I did have an outside studio, but since I have a home studio, right. working at home with my husband is something we've been doing for a long time. Yeah. Um, but just going out once a day for a walk and maybe once a month to food shop is a huge <laughs> adjustment. You know, that's the highlight of the month. That's right. <laughs> that's right. You're dressing up for that after all. <laughs> so let's let's fast forward and talk a little bit about your uh, your art practice and your process. You know, I happen to love the quote that you have on your website. Let your paintings tell you what they want to be. I mean, I, I think that's just, you know, it, it, you can't say it any better. So talk to us about what you're doing. And I know you have an upcoming show. Hopefully it will happen. Well, um, I, I started doing the koi. I, when I was in business as a headhunter, we had a convention in Maui. And I first saw the koi there. And I thought, oh, my God, this is just moving color and water. This is fantastic. I took a bunch of pictures. I knew someday if I ever started painting again, I would, which I planned to do, I would probably do those, which I did, and I am still doing. I've been doing them for a very long time. And um, and then I started in 2013, I think it was, I started looking at my palette and I thought, boy, there's some interesting stuff happening here mm. that I'm not even aware of. It's very subconscious. So right. maybe I can see how to put that on the canvas. And that's where the abstractions were born. So well, the abstractions are just amazing. And to me, they are just so, so uh, richly textured. They have so much depth to them. And they're so different from the koi. The koi, are, to me, are very animated. And I just feel the motion. And your abstracts are just, you know, rich in a very different way. They are, and they're also very geometric. And it, those are yep. pure paint. There's no medium, there's no varnish. It is just pure, raw paint, which is mm. different for me too. And when you and I talked earlier, you talked about some of the earlier training that you got when maybe you were at Penn or maybe it was Skidmore around applying a heavier hand and kind of feel, feeling that you needed to be, or you wanted to be bold in your approach. And I wonder if that, that may have happened uh, during, I was in school at Skidmore in the late 60s, mm -hmm. and I remember as a women's college, so we were encouraged to be, to do very large scale work. And I think it also suits my personality. I, I, I have to paint very quickly, because that's just the way I am. And I, I can't work forever on a painting. When I'm, I work on a painting one at a time, and when it's done, it's done. I don't go mm -hmm. back over it. So, um, so I think that's where, um, a lot of that came from. Well, you know, that, that's a good segue because I am very interested. I've been asking all of our artists, how do you know when you're done? And you had a very clear point of view about that. Well, I don't know how I know, but instinctively I, I'm pretty good at calculating that because I don't like my work to be overworked. I want it to look as though it was done very quickly mm -hmm. and um, I didn't want to kill it. <laughs> and it's easy to do that. <laughs> Right. So you just obviously you've got a very you know very clear instincts in terms of your ability to to pull back. <laughs> no, sometimes that happens to the best of us. I, one of my favorite de Kooning's quote is, "Anybody can make a good de Kooning. Only I can also make a bad one." 
<laughs> That's a good one. I, I like have that. days too. <laughs> I like that. Well, Linda, one of your pieces was um, selected to be part of the permanent collection of the Cape Ann Museum in 2017. I remember going to your opening. It was a fabulous opening of Cape Ann women artists. Mm -hmm. And congratulations on that. Um, talk to us, with all your many years living here in Cape Ann, how has your time here influenced your work? Well, I, so I, I went back and started painting when I turned 40. That's when I got married and my husband said, I don't want a frustrated artist on my hands. If you want to paint, <laughs> paint. If you don't want to paint, do something else. So I thought, okay, I'll paint. And so I have been doing it ever since. That was in 1988. Mm -hmm. And I started by doing uh, landscapes, and we lived on Foolish Point, rented a house at the time, right, and, location. and that's, that painting at the Cape Ann Museum is from that, one, that series. Ah, yeah. makes sense. It's beautiful. Just beautiful. Well, now I'd love to switch gears and talk a little bit about your, your talent as a hybrid. <laughs> you have been so successful getting your work into collections. And uh, I'd love to talk to you about um, your relationship with Beth Dang and how it all started and uh, talk to us about how you've mobilized all of your talent to be so successful as a working artist. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, Beth and I go way back. We were at Skidmore together. She was yep. an art teacher too. And she transferred after two years. I didn't even know she transferred, but she did. So, um, and then she was, she, she had a gallery on Newbury Street and I was in some other galleries initially. And I think I approached her one day and I said, gee, maybe I'll be in your gallery one day. <laughs> and so I had done a whole series of koi paintings and I invited her up to see what I was doing. And she loved them so much, she said, let's do a show. And mm -hmm. that's how that started. And it's still going after all these years, some 25 <laughs> years later. It's fantastic to have that kind of chemistry and that kind of fabulous support, you know, that's really. That's where the networking helps, too. You know, yes. knowing people, keeping up with people, finding out where they are. And, um, and I think also being in more than one gallery helps. I've had work in New York, a New York gallery. I've had work in Houston. You know, you have to get your stuff out there. Right, right. And you've done such a great job of mobilizing all of your, your rich marketing <laughs> skills to be able to do just that. Well, I don't think we have to. I don't think it's a choice anymore. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, so talk to us about your observations of this market. I mean, you mentioned, uh, you know, a few minutes ago that people are still buying paintings. You've been so successful just in the recent months of continuing to sell. Well, you know, Beth and I had a great start in January before all this this uh, shutdown happened. And I thought, oh, goody, I'm going to have a stellar year. And then, of course, <laughs> uh, we, we didn't know what was up. But, but, you know, it's always been my my feeling that I I think, oh, my God, I just sold my last painting. And I, you know, for when I was a headhunter, I lived on commission. So I'm kind of used to not... Yes. Being assured of a paycheck. So um, you hope that somebody sees what you're painting and appreciates it. Um, so I, yeah, it, I just sold a painting, I think, a couple weeks ago, which was lovely. So yeah. it, it is Fantastic. happening. But again, social media, you have to let people know what you're doing. Right, right. And and talk to us about your relationship with First Dibs, because I have seen your work on First Oh, Dibs. well, Beth Erdang did that. You know, she's done an awful lot of the marketing. That's how a lot of the corporate work has been sold. And ah, um, and sure. a lot of the corporate stuff, um, you know, it was a time when corporations were buying a lot of art, and they haven't been for quite a while, since 2008, really. Here and there, but it's uh -huh. not or as... selectively. More selectively. Yes. Well, they don't have the, the finances to do it anymore. Sure. So yeah. that, that changed, but yeah, so. Well, well, talk to us a little bit about your role. You've been, you know, visible as an arts leader. You, on the Mon you were on the Montserrat board of directors for, I want to say, seven years. Uh, you were a visiting artist also with Montserrat College of Art. Uh, you've been an art critic, uh, I believe, with FIT in New York City. Um, you've been a lecturer. Talk to us about how those roles have helped to influence or shape your career. Well, let's see. Um, I think that Montserrat sort of happened by accident. I, I um, had had a rejection for, from a juried show um, 
a long time ago, and I thought, oh, I'm going to turn this into a positive day. So I walked into a gallery in Hamilton, uh -huh. the ARA gallery that is yep. run by uh, Ingrid Swanson, and I showed her my work, and she gave me a solo show on the spot, which was great. And then at my opening, the one of the trustees from Montserrat said, gee, would you like to be a trustee? And I thought, I don't even know what that's about, but sure, I'll be interested in pursuing it. So I did that, which was great. And I all, and we, we did a lot of, a lot of, I've done an awful lot of volunteer work mm -hmm. um, time and also given away a lot of work. Um, and I've met a lot of people. I had a, raised a stepson who um, went to Shore Country Day. And so I met a lot of people that way. Mm -hmm. So many of my friends have also become my collectors. Which is yeah, it's fantastic. Lovely. Linda. Lovely. And Fantastic. Well, you just have such a, you know, a dynamic, very inviting way. So um, kudos to you for, for keeping up with so much great momentum. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't know that I'm still that introvert that I, I mean. No, that, you would not I, know. I have to believe myself. It's you not a long, <laughs> long way. No grass grows under your feet. <laughs> <laughs> so Linda, listen, I want to thank you. It's such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank, thank you so you much for joining us today. And for our listeners, I want to indicate that we've been talking to Linda Holt, very accomplished painter. Uh, you can view this interview on 1623 Studios social media platforms to include Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Channel 12. I'm Christine Fisher. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks, Christine. <laughs>